Hi, I'm Tony Carnes, your host for A Journey to NYC Religions Television. Today, we're really happy to have the return of John Coverdell, a former uh, retired law professor, historian of the Catholic lay organization, Opus Dei. He is going to talk to us about how do we exist during this coronavirus and the social chaos and how we can actually grow our spiritual life. Glad you could be with us. How can Christians flourish in the chaos caused by this pandemic, this national um, tragedy and debate and conflict? How can Christians flourish and can they flourish in such a situation? Well, I, I think they certainly can. Uh... And I guess I think that they can flourish really in much the same way as, say, the Christians of the first century did, who lived in very chaotic conditions. Nero was burning Rome and all that sort of thing. Uh, and yet the uh, first followers of Christ and the disciples of St. Paul uh, managed to somehow focus on, on their love of God, on their love of other people. At least I can help the people immediately around me. Uh, and nowadays, people are very much immediately around me because so many of us are, are staying at home 24-7. A friend called me uh, who was just uh, a little stir-crazy staying in. Uh -huh. And... Uh, just kept uh, sort of um, focusing inward on this, um, the, the, the sort of bringing the chaos into his life. And, uh, and it was a little hard for him to break out of that. How, how would you advise him, uh, not as a, a professional counselor, but as a, mm -hmm. a Christian who's thought about um, how we can grow? What would you advise him to do in a situation like that? That where you maybe you're working from home and you're not seeing anybody and you're losing contact with people and uh, you're single and all of a sudden you're just a little bit, you know. Well, I think it is particularly difficult uh, in some ways if, you know, you're single and you're really alone. Uh, I, I think that does make it much harder. And I think part of it is reaching out to people. Um, I was listening to uh, NPR a few days ago and they were talking with some sort of specialist. I don't recall exactly what the woman's credentials were. I think she was an epidemiologist and she says, well, maybe you want to expand your cocoon a little, bring in one or two other families that you know that they're pretty careful, et cetera, and they're your good friends and you can begin to see them. And so it's not perfect from the point of view of the virus, but it's much better than just being isolated all alone in your apartment. And of course, we can all reach out to people, uh, you know, telephone. The telephone probably indicates how old I am that I think of that as the medium to use. But uh, whatever medium, uh, you know, suits you uh, to reach out to friends, to call people. I've been talking to people uh, fairly frequently who are, you know, far away on another continent and who I haven't really talked to in ages. But I say, well, here's a chance to, we're all at home, <laughs> let's get together for a half hour and talk. Are there any uh, spiritual practices uh, one might do in, in this type of situation? Uh, particularly, I know Opus Dei and you are a historian of Opus Dei, one of the most noted historians of Opus Dei, a law professor by background, and you call yourself retired, but we know that you're not retired. You're well, so active. I'm not being paid, let's put it that way. <laughs> yes, unpaid. <laughs> um, but I know that um, Opus Dei specializes in how can you find uh, God and meaning inside your everyday life, like your work life. 
but well, how think, about if you're working at home alone, how do you find, how do you cultivate spirituality in that situation? Well, first of all, even when you're working at home alone, you are working for other people in some way. Not, not so much in the sense that you have a boss, which maybe you don't. Huh? Some people maybe don't. But in the sense that hopefully your work is, is a service of one sort or another to other people. And I think trying to focus on that. And then I would say trying to see, you know, that work is really very much at the core of what God is asking of us. Okay. I mean, his, his son, Jesus, spent the vast majority of his life working at an ordinary job. Maybe he was a carpenter, maybe he was some other kind of craftsman. I don't really know that, but we do know he was a craftsman of some sort or another. And I suppose that in that society, he probably started working fairly seriously by the time he was 10 or 12. And he worked at that until he was 30. Uh, and he wasn't wasting his time. I mean, I think that's the one of the temptations for a Christian, I think, is to think that Christ uh, was just waiting for his real mission to begin. Huh? Uh, and I think that's, that's not true. I think he was redeeming us by building tables and fixing roofs and doing the other things he did every day there in Nazareth. And, and our work can also be redemptive can be offered to God because pretty clearly it's part of what he asks of us. Right? He asks us to, to work and to serve others through our work. Oh, he, he, it's, that's clear. He asked us to do that. I thought it was better to go to a monastery and withdraw from work. Well, two things. First of all, uh, the monks in a monastery don't just sit there all day either. You know, they spend a large part of their time working. You know, St. Uh, Benedict, uh, one, I think maybe his most famous saying was, ora et labora, pray and work, right? And his monks worked. And he, and he gave us the time clock. <laughs> and he gave, you know, that, yeah, so uh, even in the monastery, the monks work. But second, that's a special vocation. God calls some people to that. Uh, and for them, that's certainly the best, you know, to respond to that call. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't call the rest of us. Huh? He just doesn't call us to that special vocation of going off to a monastery or something like that. He calls us to try to sanctify ourselves and try to serve him in daily life at home with our friends, etc., I noticed, I, I've heard that you uh, have been developing teaching the catechism online, the Catholic catechism online. That's right. Is that true? Yeah, that is quite true. Yes, I've been doing a one hour session about every other week. What, and, uh, for our audience, what, what is a catechism? Well, a catechism is a exposition of the church's teaching of its doctrine the classic catechisms were often in the form of question and answer. Uh, and there were often quite simple catechisms for say young children. And the, the most famous Catholic one in the United States, the Baltimore Catechism begins, who made us? God made us. Why did God make us? He made us to know, love and serve him in this world and to be happy with him in the next. And that's kind of hard to beat. You know, in terms of knowing who you are and where you are. But the catechism that I've been going over, which is called the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the big thick volume, it's probably 800 pages or so, is not in question and answer form. And it was really written largely to provide a basis for people who might be writing other kinds of catechisms. But it's a, it's a very rich summary of what it means to think as a Catholic, okay? And it has four parts. And the first part goes over the articles of the creed. At Sunday Mass, we say this 
formula of belief that begins, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And the catechism expands on all of that, those articles of the creed, and that's the part we're doing. Doing this online, it, there are people finding that this is a, a useful way of learning the catechism, and, and does it affect their lives in this pandemic period? Well, uh, I guess they found it useful because they come back. <laughs> so I guess if they, if they yeah, anyway, we're not talking about some huge group of people, you know, we're talking about 25, 30 people or something like that. Um, and that's about for a class, like this is sort of like a class. That's, yeah, that's a good number. It is a class. And, uh, and I think, yes, it does help people. I mean, I try to, uh, as we're going over the more, if you like, more abstract doctrinal points to try to point out how they somehow or other relate to our current circumstances. Uh, but even if I didn't do that, and I think for, for anyone, I think, but certainly a Christian, it's very useful to remind oneself of kind of the big picture of where am I and what's this all about? And uh, is, is this all there is, <laughs> et cetera, right? And to remind oneself, well, no, it's, it's not all there is. There's, there's what I see right here and now, but there's a God and there's a, a heaven and life is, uh, much richer than what I just see. Huh? I, if I remember right, uh, the founder of Opus Dei, Jose Maria Escriva, uh, sort of emphasized something that might be relevant today, and that is to have a bright and cheerful home. Yes. Am I right about that? You're exactly <laughs> right, yes. How did he uh, teach about that? About... Um, uh, you know, if you're a dad or a mom, how do you foster an atmosphere like that? That you mentioned, they're trying to, to try to foster forget a, about themselves and home, focus on the others. Uh, so, and I think in our current circumstances, that's so important, right? That trying to think about what will make other people in my surroundings in my home happy uh how can i help them uh and trying to forget about myself and what i want and whether i find this irritating now you know that none of that is easy huh? it's not a you know kind of magic formula to say oh well fine now i know i just do that well no it, it's it's a uh, a struggle all day every time but it's a it's a great thing to focus on it can be something so simple as trying to smile you know so trying to he, he would <laughs> often emphasize say sometimes we need to see smiling faces around us and i think in these circumstances that's especially true right that uh, we need people to smile and project a certain cheerfulness even if you know we do have our irritations and our problems and things that we're worried about and so on but we can we can try to put those things a little bit in the background and smile now let me see if i i, I wanted to ask you about the founder of opus day and let me see if i've got and pronouncing his name a uh, uh, right jose maria escriva perfect um you were actually with him for a number of years. That's correct, about eight years, yes. Which is uh, really remarkable. It, it was a great uh, gift or a great grace, really, to, yes, to see him and talk with him. How did he make your day cheerful? Well, he smiled a lot. Huh? In the uh, morning when he comes in, did he come in with, oh my gosh, it was a terrible night, or did he come in with some he, other way? He never, he almost never complained about anything, mm. okay? 
I mean, in the eight years I was there, I think I maybe heard him complain two or three times. Now, I suspect that he to the, complained more to people who were really close to him, who were you know, like his spiritual advisor and so on. I'm sure sometimes he said, well, I know one time, he, <laughs> I kind of liked this story. When there, in the building there, there was an internal phone system. And uh, one night, when there was a whole set of problems that had been ongoing for a while about the juridical situation of Opus Dei, et cetera. And one night uh, he called the person who was closest to him, who was his, ultimately his first successor, Don Alvaro. And he said, Alvaro, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> and Don Alvaro just said to him, well, Father, we've been saying that for the last month. And he said, you're right, my son, good night. <laughs> But, you know, sometimes he had the, uh, a phrase he used, uh, which I think was taken from Teresa Avila, said that souls need a drain pipe. Huh? They have to let things out and talk about them. Uh, yes. But, it, but, it, but that's not the same as being all the time around complaining. <laughs> right. Right. That at the right moment, in the right way, the right person, yes, to to vent a little, to get rid of the one's concern. I'm curious, when you had a, um, a big problem that you had to handle while you were working with him, how would he um, help you along to address that in the right way? Well, let me see if I can... A concrete. Think. Yeah, I, I, I can't say that I can think, I mean, he would just... I think he would primarily just kind of demonstrate his confidence in in the little group that I worked in, and here's this, and work it out. You can do it. Uh, well, and of course, he encouraged us to you know to pray and to uh, ask God's help, etc. But we didn't have any really terrible problems, to be honest with you. And you are. Uh, I know you've written some. Uh, you wrote a biography of him, right? Well, I wrote a, a kind of history of Opus, of the early years of Opus Dei that right. does focus very heavily on him as a person. Okay. And, and now you're writing a, an overall history. Is I'm writing an overall history, a more institutional history of what, what this institution in the church has done and, and undergone, etc. Yes. Now that's a, a much bigger job. How, how do you go about tackling such a big job? Well, I is, wasn't, wasn't and isn't uh, entirely my project. So I was approached about it by a Spanish priest member of Opus Dei. He's a very good historian who just turned 50. And it was really his idea, his project. Uh, and I'm doing just the years of St. Jose Maria's first successor, so about 20 years. Okay. And how do I go about it? Well, I've uh, spent a couple of months in Opus Dei's archives in Rome uh, with my phone uh, and just taking pictures. Chop! Chop! Yeah. That's and such I, a wonderful uh, tool for uh, archival research. Oh, it's marvelous, you know, and then I come back and I print it all out and then I start sorting it and saying, oh, what do I, well, first I really read it because working there, I don't, I just read enough to say, yes, this is worth capturing. Right. And uh, only when I get back do I sit down and really read each page. And then I, you know, organize it by subjects. And then I, I start to write. I often do it dictating with Dragon Dictate. Yeah. And uh, so the, 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 when, have you going through the archives? Did you come across a document or something that says, "Oh my gosh, that is like, that is so valuable. That is really good." Do you have those moments going through? Well, the sure. I mean, I don't know that any of them are. I don't know that I came across any single document that was, you know, kind of earth shaking or right. changed the the overall picture or even the picture of a smaller segment. 
But certainly I found documents that are very interesting and a lot of documents that are terribly dull and <laughs> say, hey, this really isn't, e either it really isn't interesting at all or I don't have enough imagination to figure out how it could be woven into the story. You know, maybe somebody else working on it say, oh, that's really interesting. And I say, you know, history, yeah. history is very much always the creation of the author you know it's based on facts etc but that's that's why we can have whatever it is you know a couple thousand biographies of george washington right it's not so much that the facts are different it's what each author thought was important how they focused on it and you know same kind of thing happens when you're writing the kind of history i'm writing any surprises that uh, that said, well, I I didn't know that, or I thought it was different. Um, in small things, I mean, the overall picture I think was was reasonably clear beforehand. It's more a question of bringing together stuff that was around in different places, but uh, not easily accessible. Um, I mean, I think one thing that uh, is very interesting is just the closeness of uh, Don Alvaro, St. Josemaria's first successor, with John Paul II. I mean, they were really good friends. Okay? Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, you see it, one little story, which goes back to what we were talking about before, about the cross, you know, when John Paul II was shot and he was there in the hospital. And I don't, I think they kind of largely botched his treatment and he was not recovering well. And finally, after more than a month, I think, he was able to have a few visitors and one of them was Don Alvaro. And Don Alvaro said to him, look, your holiness, the way I see it, you know, suffering is always salvific, but when it is the suffering of the Holy Father, it is doubly so. And I see this as a caress from Our Lady. And the Pope responded to him, I see it the same way. But, you know, that's a very, you have to be a real, first of all, you have to have a lot of faith, but you also have to be really good friends to someone who's been shot to tell them, you know, I see this as a crest from Our Lady. This, this is good for you. This is good for everybody. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, most people would say, well, I prefer she caress somebody else. But he knew who he was talking to. But, you know, the other little story that I, I like to tell, I, I knew it before I started on this project, but uh, at least one year at Christmas, uh, John Paul II sent to Don Alvaro a panettone, one of these Italian Christmas cakes. Yes. Now, to me, to me, that's just wonderful. He that, sent it to who? He sent it to our prelate. Huh? Your head of Opus Dei. The head of Opus Dei. The successor to Jose Maria. Espirito. No, he, Jose Maria was dead at this time. Okay. So, uh, to the head of Opus Dei. I mean, to me, that's just kind of wonderful. I mean, a Pope, well, he sends, I don't know, a crucifix, a picture of Our Lady, a picture of himself signed, but a panettone? I mean, that's just great. What did he get? Huh? One might be tempted to not consume it, but to save it. Well, yeah, I don't think it would keep well. But. Yeah, that's right. Maybe our uh, our producer, Brian, can uh, show me uh, how many minutes we have left so that we know when okay. to wind up. Uh, uh, Brian, could you do that for us? Okay. Yeah, I'll say give it another four minutes. Okay. So we got four minutes. And I wanted to uh, come back to um, the our online experience right mm -hmm. now. As you know, we, for a while, people could not go to mass and right. they had to do it on, online. Um, what is Opus Dei uh, advising and telling people how to go about doing mass online? Well, uh, 
I think we're advising people to try to do it with with piety, with attention, even to perhaps follow along with with a missile with the written texts, even though you know understand what's being said, but still can be helpful to read. Even to dress reasonably well for mass, not to even though you know nobody's going to see you, but the Lord sees you. Right. So to you know put on a, a nice shirt and pants or something, and uh, not be there in your pajamas or <laughs> your uh, bathrobe. Uh, and then just to try to follow with attention. For, I guess for people who are members of Opus Dei, we often remind them of the period, uh, about a year, when uh, the founder was not able to say mass during the Spanish Civil War. Huh? She couldn't get the, the wine and the host. This was back meat. in the 1930s. Yes, back in the 1930s, and oh. how he would just go through the prayers, huh? uh, even though he didn't have the wine and the hosts necessary for actually saying mass, but go through the prayers and with deep devotion and say, well, maybe pray to him, ask him to help you have the kind of devotion that, that he had when he was praying. Pray to the Holy Spirit before mass, before you begin seeing mass on television ask him to help you to participate with piety even though you know you're only doing it through the television let me uh remind our producer ryan that i can see him and he can count down with his hands when i need to cut off okay um i did have um one other question about the mass online because i'm wondering do you find the mass online when you do it online that it's as moving or has the same effect? Well, I'm just being told that we need to wind up. Okay. So this is going to be continued for next time. I'm All right. Uh, with John Coverdale for a journey through NYC Religions Television. Thank you very much for joining us.